Praise the Lord and good evening, church. So good to be with you again tonight. We're going to invite the presence of the Lord into this place, worship Him, and lift up His name. Please keep in prayer those that we mentioned this morning, uh, Sister Pat Grinnell, Sister Barbara Dell and her family, her daughter Angel, who had gone through surgery, and then also for the Murphy family. Joe Murphy passed away. This is Brian Murphy's father. So let's keep them in prayer. Let's welcome the Lord into this place tonight. Amen. Father, we thank you. We love you, Jesus. We give you all glory and honor tonight, God. And we just are inviting your presence, God, to minister to us as we worship you, as we praise you, God, that you'd fill our homes and our hearts, God, in this place with your glory tonight. And we just want to thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing, all that you continue to do, God. And we give you all glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together tonight.
just lift your hand to him right now. God, you see our situation, Lord. You know our hearts are dead, God. God, I just pray right now that your Shekinah glory would flow through us right now. Flow through us, Lord. God, I pray if there's anything that binds us in Jesus' name, that it would be loosed. Hallelujah, Jesus. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God and our businesses, Lord, for your provision and your strength, God, for your goodness and your glory to be poured out upon us, God, for your church, God, to take your word, God, into our communities and for our families to be blessed of you, God. Hallelujah. 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 Yes, Jesus. Jesus, for your grace. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. If you need a miracle, why don't you just call in the name of Jesus right now? Why don't you agree together with somebody? I'll agree with you right now for your need, whatever it is. In Jesus' name, God, whatever healing there might be that needs to take place, God, I plead your blood over those individuals. Lord God, whatever provision, God, financial need there might be, God, I plead your blood, God. I agree with them for, Lord God, you to make a way right now. Lord God, for relationships that need to be restored, God. For, Lord God, those that need to repent, God. For those, God, that need to come back to you, God. For strength to be given to live for you according to your word, Jesus. Hallelujah for your grace, your mercy. Hallelujah, hallelujah. For those that need delivered, God, I pray that you would allow faith to come into our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. I just want to say again, as I said this morning, thank you to all of those that have been involved in the 
media aspect of this and our uh, worship aspect, allowing us to continue during this time of, Lord, where we're uh, instructed to not gather together in large numbers. I'm so thankful. I don't like it, but I'm thankful that we still have the opportunity, amen, through video uh, to be able to share the Word of God and to be able to be of one mind and one accord, amen. Truly, we are uh, going through things and experiencing things and uh, really finding out the ingenuity of a lot of people during this time. Amen. A lot of things out there that people are just figuring out that they got to do themselves. And I think that self-reliance is a good thing. Amen. So uh, I want to get into the Word of God tonight. We're going to, uh, when we get into the Scriptures, going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. And then Luke chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. So those are the going to be the key scriptures that we're going to look at today. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. We love you, Jesus. We ask, God, that you continue to bless and pour out your spirit. God, that you'd help us tonight, God, as we get into your word, Lord Jesus. We need your strength, your wisdom, your direction, God. Help us during this time, God, to continue to trust in you, God. Not to lean on our own understanding, but in all our ways to acknowledge you. And, Lord, that you would direct our path. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to start a series that I've taught before in the past. Um, and this series, I just want to give credit where credit is due, honor where honor is due. It's from a book uh, that was written by a pastor named Robert Morris. The book is called The Blessed Life. And uh, so I'm going to kind of change things up with the wording a little bit. And I've um, done some studying through this. I use a lot of his thoughts and... Uh, and a lot of his scriptures, and then I've added to it. Um, but he did a great, a, a superb job on teaching about how to be blessed and about the blessed life that we can have in Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful for that. And, and he really feels that it was uh, God showing him some things that he could share it with the world around him. Amen. So we know that there are principles in God's word. And when I say that, it means that there are things that God has declared that he will follow through with. God cannot lie, the Bible says. Okay, God cannot fail. His word will come to pass. We don't always understand how it's going to happen, right? We don't always understand how God is going to do it. But what we can trust is that he's able to. It doesn't mean he'll always do it in our timing. It doesn't mean he'll always do it to the amount or to the extent that we would like. It doesn't mean that he'll always do it exactly the way we would like. But when we pray, as Jesus prayed in the garden, we need to pray, God, not my will, but your will be done. Because God knows better. Amen. So this series I, I've named, I Am Blessed. And this first lesson is just titled, That It's a Heart Thing that it's dealing with our heart. And so there's some things we're going to talk about uh, that if we're going to be blessed, we got to make sure we uh, take care of some things in our heart. Amen. So in Matthew chapter 6 is where I'm going to kind of begin. I'm not going to necessarily go into any scriptures here, but I just want to follow up that Jesus had just got done teaching on the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Okay? And now... And in the Beatitudes, it says, blessed are they that mourn, blessed are they that, you know, this, and blessed are they that that. And, and that word blessed there almost, almost denotes an existing condition of their heart. It's not that they're blessed because they're going to uh, be comforted. It's that because they're blessed, they will be comforted. And so it almost talks about a, a condition of their heart, a decision they've already made. So if we are going to be blessed, certainly it is God that pours out the blessing, but it's also an attitude. It doesn't mean I have to have something or receive something tangible from God. It's just because of who he is and who I have the opportunity to be in him that I can be blessed. And so in Matthew 6 then, uh, Jesus teaches on a couple things right away in the first Four verses he teaches on giving, and then in the next uh, in the next ten verses he teaches on prayer, and then in the following few verses he teaches on fasting. So there's some principles in here that he begins to teach. And so in this series, in this uh, in these lessons, it will really show us how that we can live a blessed life and how that life can affect and how it can. Inf 
influence every area of our life. So a couple of scriptures we're going to look into. First is Matthew 7, verse 1 and verse 2. And that simply says, Judge not that you be not judged. Okay? For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Okay, so remember, we're talking about being blessed. And we have to understand what being blessed means. It means to be fortunate. It means to be well off. And it means that we're trusting God. So again... Matthew wrote, judge not that you be not judged, for with judgment, with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet or what measurement you use, it shall be measured to you again. So when we look at these two verses here, we can understand that the subject of what these verses are, if we were just going to pick one word to describe it, that subject would be judgment. I think we could agree on that because he says, don't judge or you're going to be judged. And whatever you judge, you're going to be judged back. Okay, so there is an emphasis. There is a declaration on judgment. And we understand and we know, and I'm going to get to this in a minute, but this might not make sense right now. But the word money is not mentioned in verses 1 and 2 of Matthew 7. We can agree on that. It's not talking about money. And so... When we really commit that to memory and when we think about it, judge not, you won't be judged. With the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Okay, so now we're going to look at a parallel passage in the Gospel of Luke chapter 6. And this is verses 37 and 38. Now this is the parallel message, and it's a little bit different, but it is a lot alike. Again, the first verse, judge not and you shall not be judged. That's the same as what Matthew said. But then Luke goes on and he says, Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. And now verse 38. And this is where sometimes the confusion has come in in the past. Give and it shall be given unto you. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, he says, and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure, again, that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Now, we've heard this verse before, probably, given, it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. And a lot of times when we've heard it or it's been preached, a lot of times the topic was money. It was about finances. But this is the same passage as Matthew 7. Now, not all of verse 38 is in, verse, uh, is in the same as in Matthew, but it's the same topic. It's the same, uh, it's the same subject. He's talking about judgment, and it's not a verse on giving money. So, as it turns out, and many times in the Bible... Um, we need to understand how it's being written to us. Now, looking things up in the Greek is very important. I do that a lot of times. But also understanding just our language, English, is very important. So we understand that uh, when we know what it's being written and what the different um, parts of the sentence are, it can help us understand the Bible. So in Luke 6.38, give is the verb. Give, it's an action, right? So it's a verb. You is the implied subject. You or me or anybody. It is the objective pronoun, so it has to be replaced with something. So it's saying when you give, it shall be given unto you. Whatever it is that you give, whatever you replace it with, it will be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It reminds me of a video that I watched on YouTube uh, uh, many times and, and quite a while ago when I first saw it. But uh, uh, Reverend Johnny James, uh, he was on an airplane, and you can look this up on YouTube. Just uh, research uh, Johnny James on YouTube. And, and he's speaking to somebody on an airplane, and he's having a, a debate, if you will, with another theologian. And the debate falls into the oneness of God and baptism. And so Johnny James is a oneness apostolic preacher, and he baptizes in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And the other individual uh, baptized another way in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
So when they were coming back into the country after this discussion, and, and, and Johnny James has to fill out this form, he says, and he asks for another one that he's just going to mess with a little bit. And so when you come back in, he said you had to fill out what country you're from, what state you're from, and what city you're from. And so when he wrote on there in the part of country, he wrote country. In the name of state, he wrote the word state. In the name of city, he wrote the word city. And he asked the fellow again, he says, am I doing this right? And he says, no, no, you messed it all up. That's not, that's not how you do it. He, and then he began talking about common nouns and proper nouns. The common noun is country. The proper noun is the United States. The common noun is uh, state, and your state is, I think it was Michigan. And the name of the city is not city. The name of the city, the proper name would be Detroit, I think it was, is where he was from. And so he began to teach him that. And so he said, you know, me writing country for the name of the country and state for the name of the state and city for the name of the city is no different than you writing father is the name of the father and son is the name of the son and Holy Spirit is the name of the Holy Spirit. Those are common nouns. That's what they are. But his name, the proper noun, is Jesus Christ. And he taught him a lesson uh, through that example. And so it's important that we do understand how the Bible is being written. It doesn't say if you give money Money. money is just implied there because that's where our mind goes. But give anything, and whatever it is that whoever gives it, when they give it, it shall be given back. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Amen. So 638 of Luke can be a wonderful verse, and at the same time it can be a very frightening verse. Because whatever you give, you're going to get back in God's economy more of it. So if you give judgment, you're going to give judgment back. If you give uh, criticism, you're going to get criticism back. If you get, give anger, you're going to get anger back. And it's going to be pressed down and it's going to be shaken over, uh, shaken together and running over. But if you give mercy, you will get mercy back. If you give love, you can get love back. If you give kindness, you can give kindness back. Luke 6 and 30 says, give to every man that asks of you. So whatever you give, you'll get back. Trust, kindness, love, all of those things. And so the challenge is then that we don't begin thinking, well, I want to get, so I'm going to give. Because when it comes to our finances and it comes to giving in church, a lot of times that can be our mindset if we're not careful that I want to get, so I'm going to give. I pay my tithes so that God will give me an increase. That's not the motive to give. That's the reward. We give to give. We don't give to get. That's not the purpose. You know, God's not saying, this is great. This is so wonderful. You know, I'm so glad people are catching on to the understanding of how to get. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about that if we will give whatever it is that we give, God will give it back to us. Amen. Men will give it back to us. God will bless it. He will anoint it. If we give kindness, mercy, grace, all of those things. So when we think about the fact that it was God in his word, way back in, in Exodus and Leviticus and in the law of Moses, God implemented giving. And now I'm talking about finances because I do want to be blessed and I want God's church to be blessed. I want each and every one of you to be blessed. So God implemented giving. So when you think about that, here is the one who the Bible says owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't need anything. We cannot give anything and add to God. You can't give God the best compliment. You can't give God uh, the best apparel or the most money and add to God and make God more because we can't do it. So God didn't implement giving for him. He implemented giving for us. So we need to get to the point where we give to give, where I give to support and to build the kingdom of God, where I give uh, to support and help those who are in need. It's his kingdom. I don't need to build up my kingdom. And it's so easy for us to get into that mindset of wanting to add and wanting to uh, obtain and wanting to gather and wanting to keep. Another thing is that God 
doesn't just bless giving. God blesses giving with the right attitude, the right heart, the right spirit. God honors faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. So when we give in faith, we give to honor God, and God can bless that. So if we're giving because we're selfish... If we're giving because we're greedy, I don't believe God can bless that. I don't believe God does honor that. But when God blesses us, when we give to help somebody, when we give to further his kingdom. So we have to learn how to help others. Learn how to help people in need. And when we do it, that will begin to change our heart. If you've ever done that, if you've ever saw the person standing there with a cardboard sign that says, can you please help? I've got a family. I've got children. I'm hungry. And you give to help them sincerely. It, mess, it blesses your heart. It messes with your mind, right? It begins to change your whole way of thinking. It makes you feel good inside. But you didn't do it just so you could get a good feeling or so you could be seen by the cars behind you. No, you did it because you wanted to minister to that person. So there's some things that we need to learn about our heart because it's a heart thing, right? So we're going to talk a little bit here about the, the year of Jubilee in the Old Testament. And on the year of Jubilee, if you're not familiar with it, all debt was canceled every seven years. So if you had a debt, if you borrowed money or if you had sold something to be used or let somebody use something because you owed money or land or whatever it was, at the end of seven years, that debt was canceled and you got back what you had lent out or what you had put up for loan. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 15 and 7 through verse 15, God speaks to his children. Moses is talking to the children of Israel and God is speaking through him. And I'm going to read through this, and then we're going to talk and break this down about the four areas of our heart we have to work on. So in the first verse, seven, Deuteronomy 15 and 7, it says, If there be among you a poor man, one of your brethren, not just a stranger, but one of your brethren, within any of your gates in the land which the Lord God gave you, that you didn't get yourself, you shall not harden your heart. Okay, you don't shut your hand from your poor brother. Jesus said the poor you're always going to have. There will always be people with more and there will always be people with less. That's just the way it's always been. And so if there is a poor man, one of your brethren, don't shut your hand. Don't harden your heart. Because God wants you to bless them out of the land that he gave you. He says in verse 8, But you shall open your hand wide unto him, and you shall surely or willingly lend him sufficient as much as he needs in that which he wants. Okay? So we have to do that willingly. So uh, the first thing that we have to deal with is a selfish heart. Right? We, we're, we're born selfish. One of the first things we learn after the word no as a little kid is the word mine, right? When kids, you see little kids and they see a toy. Now, not always. We teach them to share, but it just comes naturally to say, this is mine. I want this. I want to hold on to this. So we have to deal with a selfish heart. And it's really easy because the Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? So verse 9 says in this, okay, when he says don't harden your heart. Whenever they come to you, lend to them what they need. He says in verse 9, beware, he says, beware that there not be a thought in thy wicked heart, in your selfish heart, saying this is the seventh year, the year of release. It's at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him not, and he cries unto the Lord against you, it shall be sin unto you. So again, Jubilee was the seventh year. So don't say it's the sixth year, okay? Uh, don't say the seventh year is at hand. It's right around the corner. If it was the first year, he would have another six years to pay me back. But now it's the sixth year. It's a six and a half year. The seventh year is just around the corner. He's not going to have time to pay me back that much money, so I'm not going to lend him. Don't be selfish, God says. He doesn't like it. And then he cries to the Lord against you. He says, it will be sin to you. 
Now again, this is in the law of Moses. So we have to deal with that selfish heart. So verse 10, he goes on and he says, Thou shalt surely give him, and thy heart shall not be grieved when you give to him, because that for this thing the Lord your God shall bless you in all your works. So when you give and your heart is not grieved, God can bless that and in all that you put your hand to. That means that God is not only going to bless everything you've already done, he's going to bless everything you're going to do. That's important. I want God. Remember, this is about receiving the blessings of God. This is about having a blessed life and being blessed. So we have to deal in verse 10, not only just like verse 9 said, a selfish heart. Now we have to deal with a grieving heart. So selfishness deals, uh, we have to deal with that. That attacks before we give. Grief attacks after we give. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Why did I, why did I give that? Per- why did I loan that money? They're never going to pay me back. We, we grieve over money, don't we? We do. Oh, I wish, man, if I just had the money... When I was young, man, if I just would have stayed at home and lived at home a little bit longer and saved the money, if I wouldn't have bought those foolish things, if I just, we grieve over money. If I wouldn't have given that away, just think of all, if I had back everything that I ever gave away or wasted or lost, we grieve over it. God says don't be grieved over money that we give into his kingdom or to his people because that's what happens. We give something maybe to the church, And then something goes wrong right after that, and the devil says, oh, you shouldn't have given that. I think it'd be okay to share this testimony uh, that uh, many of you probably heard Brother Putnam share before when he pastored here. But if you've not, it's an incredible testimony. He had given an offering one time, and I don't remember exactly all the details, but after he had given this offering and and decided to give this offering and make this commitment, knowing that his uh, children were going to need to go to college and, and his oldest child was getting ready to go into college, the enemy began to attack him and saying, you're giving away her college fund. You're giving away the money that's going to send your kids to college. You are, you are putting your kids behind the, behind the eight ball. They are never going to succeed because you're giving this money. The enemy wanted to attack, but God blessed and God allowed a way for that to still take place. So we can't allow the enemy to lie and to, and to get us to believe a lie. Another reason why we grieve over money we lose or spend or give is because we thought it was ours. Oh, that was my money. Oh, it was mine. I earned it. But we have to remember everything we have comes from God, whether it's the land we're making the money from, whether it's the talent or the ability or the business or the knowledge, whatever it is. Who, did, who gave us that? Where did the ability to do it come from? Maybe we did put in some work and effort, but who gave us the ability to do that? It was certainly God. But we grieved because we thought it was ours. So when God asks for something that he gave us, we have to get up and say, here it is, God, I'm just, I'm just holding it for you, right? I'm just holding it. So verse 10, don't let your heart be grieved. Now we're going to go down to verse 14. And it says, thou shall furnish him liberally or generously out of all your flock and out of your floor, out of your wine press, that wherewith the Lord thy God has blessed you, you shall give him. So give it out of there. Develop. So deal with a selfish heart. Deal with a grieving heart. Develop a generous heart. That's what God wants us to do. Live generously. Get excited about giving. God has given us the resources to live generously. And as we continue to give, God will continue to pour in. As God realizes he can trust us with what he puts in our hands, God will put more in our hands. Amen. Matthew 6 and 21 says, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So your heart follows your treasure. If you put money into a stock or into an investment, what do you do? You follow that stock. You research that investment. You see what it's doing. So if I want my heart to be in the kingdom of God, that's where I've got to put my treasure. I really want to love God more. So I've got, that means put more of my treasure there. And sometimes we say, well, I don't know if I want to love God that much, right? And so give him generally, furnish him liberally, generously out of your flock. And then verse 15 the last thing we have to do is develop a grateful heart. Verse 15, 
of Deuteronomy 15, he says, you shall remember that you were a bondman in the land of Egypt. You were a slave, and God redeemed you. That's why I command you this this day. You were a slave in Egypt, and similarly, we were a slave to sin. And God brought us out. God delivered us like he did Egypt, and he blessed us, and he helped us. So don't, don't refuse to help somebody else who needs your help, because that's how God blesses you. We have to develop not just a generous heart, but a grateful heart. I mean, I can think of times when we had very, very little as a family, my wife and I, after we first got married. I, and you know what? I realize that right now what we're all going through, this might seem like a very inconvenient time to preach this series, but I think it's a very timely time to preach this series. Why? Because I want you to give your money to the church? No, because I want you to be blessed and trust God and understand that God can bless you. So don't shut off the video. Don't say, I'm not going to watch the rest of this series. Just listen to the Word of God. Allow God to minister to you and allow yourself to be tried and say, you know what, God, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to step out in faith and see what you can do in my life. Because there were times uh, when we first got married, we had some debt, we had a house, we had school loans. My wife was working part-time and still in school. And you know what? I can remember time living check to check and still not having enough to pay the bills. I can remember every time, every two weeks when we got paid to sit down uh, to do the bills and, and, and there would be tears and there would be concern. There would be worry. Why? Why? Because we didn't like living under that bondage of debt. But you know what? We still paid our tithes. We still gave a tenth off the top of our gross of our income to the church, to Jesus Christ to God, to his kingdom. We still gave offerings above and beyond that. We gave to the building fund. We gave to foreign missions. We gave to home missions. We gave sacrificially. We gave to different events and different things going on. We continued to give, and God continued to provide. And by the end of a year and a half, we had over $10,000 in savings. Why? Because... Somebody gave us some money because something happened, just happened to work out because of coincidence? No, because we trusted God. And you know what? The most, I, I, not that it's happened because I don't allow it to happen, but I imagine the most insecure way I could ever feel or what would cause me to feel the most insecure that I could ever feel is if I quit paying my tithes to God, if I quit giving my offering to his church, to his kingdom. And we're going to talk about how God put this all in place. And you know what? Again, the tithes and giving, it's not just a way for the preacher to get rich. That's not what it's about. Does it pay my, my income? Does it give me my increase? Yes, it does. But I also give and tithe of mine. So it, it's not that I'm in any different position than you. We all give. It's all equal sacrifice. Not always equal giving, but it is equal sacrifice. That's why God chose a tithe at 10%. And when I realized what my life was like before, and if you had the life that I used to live and used to have that experience as I've had and understand how God had saved you and ministered to you and blessed you, I think that you would give too. See, there's no way that I can pay him back for everything he's done for me and for everything he's given me. And I want people to know that there is a joy, there is a blessing in giving to God and giving to his kingdom. And God wants you to have a blessed life and he wants you to live blessed. He wants you to be blessed. Why? So you can be a blessing. Amen. God is so good to minister to us, to bless us, to give us the opportunity to give and to trust him. And he says, you know what? Try me and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing to you. But we've got to... We've got to look at our heart. We've got to make sure there's no selfishness, that we're not grieving. We've got to be generous, and we've got to be grateful. Amen. Amen. I hope that this has been a blessing to you. Stay in tune. Uh, there's no Sunday night service next Sunday due to Mother's Day. Amen. But then on the 17th, we are going to try to have an outdoor parking lot service. You don't want to miss that. Um, be watching Facebook for updates on that. And then, Lord willing, we'll continue with this series 
on our Sunday evenings. God bless you. Don't miss Wednesday. Brother Ryland Morgan is going to be preaching the Word of God and ministering to us, and Sister Vicki Kranz is going to be here encouraging us in prayer. God bless you. Have a great evening.